In this video, no, it's not a Holden. No, it's not an Opal. This is a Vauxhall Royale Coupe. Nice. So this is the Vauxhall Royale. And yes, it really is just um, based on the um, Opal Senator or Monza, as it was known in coupe form. And uh, the front end will be very familiar because it went to Australia for the VB Commodore. The first of the Commodores was based on this platform, albeit with Holden's own engine. Uh, the underpinnings of this car uh, are uh, Vo sorry, Opal Record E, that generation of Opal Record. We got in the UK as the Vauxhall Carlton that had a beam rear axle, albeit quite well located. Whereas the Senator and Monza and therefore the Royale and Royale Coupe have a trailing arm independent rear suspension. It's a, a very striking car, uh, I think. No rear wiper, it seems. Uh, perhaps they didn't deem it a requirement, but there we go. Royale Coupe. Really, there is not any Vauxhall in this car at all. It is pure Opal. And it replaced the um, FE Victor. Uh, which had become just a plain VX2300, um, I believe, by the very end of production. And uh, quite a sad end, really. I don't think the FE really um, gave enough. I don't think it was quite good enough. And um, ultimately, Opel would triumph. Uh, General Motors consolidated its European efforts and Opel got the preference. And all future Vauxhalls, uh, as well as a couple before this, were just pure badge engineering. Uh, the Vauxhall Cavalier Mark I, the Vauxhall Chevette, at least had a, a hint of Vauxhall styling with a different nose treatment to their Opal brethren. But the only difference here is the grille. Uh, there are headlamp wipers, but straight away I'm going to tell you they sadly don't work. And yes, I am massively disappointed about that fact. So regardless of the fact it isn't really a Vauxhall, um, I think it's probably worth having a bit of a, an explore around because these are very interesting cars. And the specification is nothing too extraordinary. We've got McPherson strut front suspension, as I've mentioned, the um, semi-trailing arm rear. But really, it's all about the interior. If you want a time warp, um, this really is it. Because look, wholesome velour. Uh, more luxurious than leather in my book. And uh, lots of... Um, why well, I assume is fake wood. I suppose it could be real wood. Maybe it is real wood. It doesn't feel quite as plasticky as I first thought. Uh, yeah, it's all going on in here. I've got a Vauxhall badge and uh, uh, horn buttons are plenty. We've got um, stalks are all on this side. Wipers and indicators controlled by one stalk. Uh, I think that one's light, maybe. Or is that column adjust? Oh, that's steering column adjust. That's good because I was finding the wheel a bit high. Uh, that's quite advanced. Uh, but yeah, look at this. It's pure 1970s and uh, I'm not sure necessarily in a good way. It's uh, very clearly inspired by America, I would say, in the American dashboards of Cadillacs and uh, yeah, nice push button um, stereo cassette player, sliding heater controls, which um, would be, be seen again um, in 1980s Vauxhalls and Opals. The Astra and Cavalier would have very similar markings uh, but yeah a world of luxury um, not in the finest fettle but um, you know this car's getting on a bit and uh, it is supremely comfortable these seats are absolutely amazing i could definitely sit here for a long time got electric windows which sadly aren't functioning brilliantly on this example apparently i have to help up the um, driver's door if i um, feel like moving it uh, but uh, yeah, we've got a sunroof as well. He's never been brave enough to open the sunroof. That sounds slightly broken. I'm going to leave it well alone. Uh, we should jump in the back, uh, I think, to see what life is like there. But uh, really, it's all about the front. I'm not sure you'd buy a Royale Coupe for um, transporting people. Look at this lovely period correct um, markings. But um, I'm going to have to pause temporarily because I can't get in. Let's try that again. There we go. Enormous doors, not very supermarket friendly. And uh, I bet these would have had plastic end caps on originally. It seems to be missing now, but still plenty of wholesome velour back here as well. And uh, oh, apparently I've got to release it to get it back. Oh, oh, and uh, uh, I think this seat is a bit too far back. 
Uh, I think there would be a bit more leg room, seems a bit more over there, but look, I've got a grab handle. I've got a window which opens, I've had a, quite how you're meant to reach that catch, I'm not sure. And of course you've got this big tailgate glass, so it's um, quite hot. The seat does um, fold down, but um, claustrophobia is getting the better of me. So I'm gonna step out and go and grab the key and we can have a look in the boot. It's not actually too dif difficult to get out of. Uh, let's slide that seat back again. There we go. I, I wouldn't say the build quality is first rate in this car, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's uh, characterful. And uh, I've got to press that button to release the key, which is a, all a bit peculiar. Now we should be able to get into the boot. Oh, there we go. The key only works one way, it turns out. But if we lift that up, uh, there would have been some elastic, I think, to lift that too. It's a very shallow boot area, but um, and there's some intake trumpet in there, which is interesting. But uh, yeah, you, you don't buy your Royale Coupe with out and out practicality in mind. Those boot struts are, oh, mighty impressive. All right, let's see if we can find the bonnet release and we'll have a look at the engine. Oh, having had my day slightly ruined by a noisy um, road sweeper that just entered the car park before I'd done the engine shots. Um, we're going to carry on anyway. So this is in the column up here somewhere. It's quite high up on the column. The hazard switch is down here, by the way. Um, out of view. Push that in. And that ticks away. Uh, here we go. Bit screechy, um, but uh, yeah, bit screechy. Uh, right, wipers, I think it's push in. Oh yeah, there we go. And then you have to turn the wipers on yourself. So that's a two-handed operation to operate the windscreen washers. That's not ideal. Uh, that's also not ideal. But the parking switch apparently is broken, so you have to park them yourself. Uh, decent overlap, no triangle of doom, but we've got drib leads and the blades could definitely come a bit higher up the screen. I do believe they are as designed. There we go, right. Into drive, three speed automatic, blah, 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 blah. And we're away. And we're gonna follow this nice Honda Accord aero deck. I think he's gonna give us our route. But uh, yeah, it's got a lovely burble to it. It's almost V8 um, in, in tone, but yeah, a, a more advanced engine I'm afraid than you had in your Holdens. But obviously to get the local, um, content up they had to use the Holden engine in Australia obviously I'm just talking about Australia a lot because I went to Australia recently and I found all the various Holdens most fascinating there is the noisy road sweeper disrupting my day all the, the very much right uh, we're taking the amazing rear lights of the um, Honda Accord aero deck very pretty car and there is a separate video upon that car. Yeah, I, I like this car. I like the noises. I like the, um, the acceleration. It feels quite urgent, but although this 2.8 litre engine does have a carburetor, the three litre had fuel injection. So that was the one people wanted. Uh, and then more specifically in this body shell, the Opel Monza GSE was the range topper towards the end of production. They facelifted the front end. The rear lights changed from being smoked red to smoked black. Uh, a very fine looking car. And these big Vauxhalls and Opals are very well supported in the UK by a club called the Autobahn Stormers. So, uh, and that is what they are. These are cars for covering distance. They're comfortable. They're, the handling isn't necessarily superb. Uh, it's a recirculating ball steering. I believe and it is a little vague bit of play in it somewhere evident I suspect but uh, yeah it's just a, an effortless car I don't know if you can see the speedometer I'm not speeding the speedometer seems to um, overread fairly dramatically so 40 is actually more like 30 but yeah it's just very nice effortless comfortable wafty experience oh 40 limit I 
Okay, I'm probably pushing it to suggest that 60 is 40. But you hear the downside now, I think. Being a free speed gearbox, this is before torque converter lockups were really a thing. So it's, um, we're doing two and a half thousand revs at about 40 miles an hour. That's not exactly relaxing. Now I'm gonna try and do my window up, but it may not. Oh no, here it goes, it's going for it, it's going for it. Yeah, made it, well done window. Bit of wind noise evident, there's some pretty big um, seals going on around these windows. So maybe that's not so surprising. Let's try and get some fan going on, see if I can get some cold air through, because I am roasting. So while the um, preceding FE Victor did actually have a fair bit of Opal in it, um, the body shell was shared with the record. The front end, the styling and the front suspension were unique to Vauxhall, whereas on these, uh, it was all over. These are 100% um, an Opal product. Despite the fact the um, plaque under the bonnet says Vauxhall Luton, uh, or Vauxhall England, I think it says. Uh, yeah, there really isn't anything English about this car. It's as English as Bratwurst. But mind you, the competition in the form of the Ford Granada was also very German. So uh, yeah, when you're comparing like for like, uh, you can see what what was becoming then in Europe. Um, Germany was becoming the land of the barge. But I will say, I think it is a much better drive than the FE Victor was. The FE Victor managed to be um, not very good at anything particularly. Um, if you want to see a video of me driving an underwhelming car, I think the FE Victor is probably the one that's come closest. Don't like the column stalk all that much. It's a very firm action. Whoa, don't open your plumbing door in front of me. So we've got a light switch, big round switch down here. Uh, again, would be a feature in later voxels as well. I don't know if pulling it makes the interior light come on. It feels like it should do, but it doesn't. I suspect that's just because that's broken. But yeah, I mean, this is nice. I, I kind of feel the need for a medallion at this point or a slightly um, a billowy shirt. Uh, I, I never felt the need to grow my hair into a permed look so much um, in my life, I don't think. I think it would go with this car very nicely. And a large dose of crimpling. Yes, yes, you, you would have to have your fine lady wearing crimpling, I think, for a car like this. Under the bonnet, we find Opel's legendary Camin head six-cylinder engine. Uh, it's a family of four and six-cylinder engines used in cars like the um, Vauxhall Cavalier in the larger 1.9 litre form, the Opel GT, the Record, the Skona, etc. Uh, but these big six cylinders reserved for the bigger cars. It's a cam in head. I don't really understand what that means, but I presume the camshaft is in the head. That would be um, quite the talking point. Uh, so the cylinder head is below here. Uh, I imagine chain drive, probably. I can't see a belt. Uh, it's an engine I don't know that much about. I would like to know more, including the power figures, which I'll insert here. So 2.8 litre and it's on a carburetor, a single Solex carburetor, which you can see hiding under there. Quite a big carb, but then it's quite a big engine. And behind that, free speed automatic gearbox. Note the McPherson strut front suspension and uh, notorious rot spots. I see this one's had some work. Uh, all this sort of area can be very crusty on these. So if you're buying one, do check with care. There we go, chance to open the old girl up. Yep, wouldn't describe her as overly brisk. Oh, and now the windows are broken. I can't do the windows up. Oh, here we go. Telling that we're struggling to keep up with the owner's um, Honda Accord Aero deck there. Uh, I think we're discovering uh, just what the difference is between 1970s and 1980s. Of course, four speed gearbox in the Honda plus a torque converter lockup. So, overall, the gearing can be set that much lower. Uh, something else this driving position, big wide transmission tunnel here for a big wide transmission. 
automatic transmissions tend to be larger than manuals and it means my clutch foot hasn't really got anywhere to go it's all a bit cramped down here but also the heat sink even though this engine is actually struggling to get up to temperature yeah really this feels so very 1970s in just the way the honda feels so very 1980s so uh yeah it's been interesting to drive the two cars back to back and it's not that the handling's bad it's just it feels a little woolly you're not quite so sure about what it's going to do but it does seem to grip and um actually corner quite nicely it does roll around because the springing is quite soft but uh not unpleasantly so I like it, even though it isn't the most dynamic product out there. So there we go. That was the Vauxhall Royale with that wonderful, sumptuous velour. Definitely a car very much of its time, but a very pleasant one to drive. So thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go. Don't forget you can head to the Hubnut store and order lovely merchandise at hubnut.org. Follow us on Patreon, patreon.com slash hubnut. And I look forward to seeing you in a future video. Farewell.